This is Michael Matheson Miller, and you are listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. Thank you again for listening to the Moral Imagination Podcast. My guest today is Michael Ward, and we're going to talk about his work, After Humanity, which is a guide to C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of man. Before we do that, thanks to all of you who've written reviews. I really appreciate it. It really helps grow the podcast. Thanks again to all of those who supported me on Patreon. Uh, If you like the podcast, please do write a review. If you do not like the podcast, just don't write a review. You can complain to your dog or something like that. Also, I wanted to let you know, I just finished a little book, about 100 pages, called Digital Contagion. And it's 10 steps to protect yourself, your business, and your family from deplatforming, from cancel culture, and from surveillance. And so I go through 10 kind of practical steps that you can take. It's also how to think about technology. So you can get that at Amazon. Uh, It's in ebook and paperback. And I was thinking, actually, I was talking to a colleague, like, what are the big influences that made me think about technology and be attentive to technology? And I'm not anti-tech in any way. Obviously, I'm using this podcast and Zencaster to get the podcast out. But I thought one of the biggest influences is really C.S. Lewis and his work, Abolition of Man. So today, my guest is Michael Ward, and he is a Catholic priest and a senior research fellow at Blackfriars Hall at the University of Oxford and professor of apologetics at Houston Baptist University. Uh, He's the author of the best-selling and award-winning Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens in the Imagination of C.S. Lewis. And I've already convinced him to come back and talk about Planet Narnia on another podcast. And he's also the co-editor of the Cambridge Companion to C.S. Lewis and presenter on the BBC television documentary, The Narnia Code. And this is, I think, uh, quite a unique achievement or blessing. On the 50th anniversary of Lewis's death, Michael Ward unveiled a permanent national memorial to Lewis in Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey in London. So thank you very much for taking time to join the Moral Imagination podcast. Thank you, Michael, for having me on the Moral Imagination podcast. Good, wonderful. Well, when I found out about your book, I was, I was very happy because I used to teach undergraduate philosophy and I would always teach C.S. Lewis, The Abolition of Man. But I would refer to it in a lot of courses, not just like intro or, or ethics things. And once I got a great compliment from a Canadian student who said to me, have you ever given a lecture where you don't mention The Abolition of Man? <laughs> I said, I hope not. I hope not. And I do really think it's one of, I mean, this is a big statement. So maybe at some time I'll correct it. But I think it's one of the five most important books in the 20th century that people need to read. It's a short book, but it really identifies just so many important issues that are relevant today. So maybe let's just start. You wrote After Humanity. I mean, this is a long book. What inspired you to do this? Well, the immediate cause was that I was asked to write a foreword to an edition of The Abolition of Man. And that foreword grew and grew and grew until it was a sort of uh, standalone book. and. That's what it now is, After Humanity, A Guide to C.S. Lewis's Abolition of Man. So that was the immediate cause, but a a background cause is that I have often tried to teach the abolition of man to my students and have found that my students find it difficult. I myself have found it difficult in the past too, and uh, I'm no philosopher, so some of the sheer content of the book is, is difficult to grasp, but also some of the presentation is rather obscure and rather oblique. Lewis is generally a very lucid and accessible writer, but here he's operating in a high-flight academic context, and he's um, he's not making it easy. On the contrary, he's making it rather difficult. And indeed, there are even moments of genuine obscurity, you know, actual bad writing, if you ask me, especially in the third chapter of three. And that's, again, those are some of the reasons why I, I wrote this guide, to clarify those those knotty bits. Well, I think it's helpful, I mean, you know, to listeners, if you've read The Abolition Man, you've struggled with it, and this is the book to get, because, I mean, you even go through things like where he'll say, you know, uh, here, I just picked out a page randomly. You'll say, I am a man who can read Mr. Olaf Stapleton with the light. And then you have a gloss where you explain, okay, who's Olaf Stapleton? What's he talking about? Sometimes he'll use a Latin phrase or he'll quote something from, say, Confucius, and you'll kind of go through that. So I think, like I said, I've taught this a lot of times. I like this book. And I thought your book was very helpful. It illuminated certain elements for me, even though I've read it a lot of times. And I, it's really great. So why don't maybe let's talk about, let's go kind of big picture before we go into some of the more you know, kind of specific questions. Let's talk about the context for Lewis in this book, what it was. It's a set of lectures. 
And he has these three, three chapters, the men without chests, the way, and then the final chapter, which is the name of the book, the abolition of man. And maybe you could give listeners a basic outline of the book for those people who haven't read it. Yeah, and a lot of people haven't read it. (laughs) Lewis was rather disappointed by its reception and regarded it as a bit of a flop. And perhaps it was in comparison to his own very successful works like uh, Screwtape and Narnia. But um, for a work of this kind, academic philosophy, it was a fairly successful seller right from the start. But yeah, what what is it about? It's about the objectivity of value. In essence, it's a defense of the objectivity of value on the one hand. And on the other hand, it is a prediction of where we might end up if we abandon belief in the objectivity of value. If we embrace thoroughgoing subjectivism, we are setting ourselves on a very bad course, which will indeed result in the abolition of man. We will be erasing an important part of our humanity if we give up on the idea of the objectivity of value. So that's the big picture. That's 30,000 feet picture. As for the three chapters, yeah, what do you want to ask? We, <laughs> we could spend a whole hour on each chapter. Right. So, I mean, maybe let's start with this, this idea of the abolition of man. I mean, what does Lewis mean, I guess, first? Let's start with this title. What does he mean by man will be abolished, right? He doesn't mean that we're all going to be killed and dead. He means that something of our humanity is robbed from us. Could you explain a little bit what Lewis means by that? Yeah, he has a a model, a philosophical model of the human person in three parts, the head, the chest, and the belly. And in the head, he says, we are like the angels, we are spiritual, we are rational. In the belly, we are like the animals in that we are sensual, we have appetites. But in the chest, we are definitively human, or at any rate, we ought to be, because it is the chest, which is the liaison officer, he says, between cerebral man in the head and visceral man in the belly. And it's the chest which unites our capacity to to think and reason with our capacity to feel and desire. And it's important to integrate those two elements, not privileging one over the other, not squelching our desires or, or for that matter, squelching our rationality but combining them. And it's the chest which makes that combination possible so that we can be, yes, emotionally intelligent, but also intelligently emotional. And that's, you know, that's a classical definition of uh, humanity, isn't it? The rational animal. Mm -hmm. If we give up on that chest, then we are either going to evaporate upwards into false spirituality, forgetting that we are embodied creatures, or we're going to devolve downwards into mere sensuality uh, and become like the beasts. Either way, we cease to be human. Right. You know, that's actually something I talk about a lot on this podcast, that we're embodied persons and embedded persons. And that the two kind of dominant errors are either spiritualism, that we're just, you know, kind of floating around, or just materialism, that that's Mm. all we are as bodies. And I think so, Lewis is dealing with it. Just one, I want to go into the head, the belly, and the chest, because I think that's one of the most important and helpful parts of the whole book. That's really where he's doing anthropology, right? Not just ethics, but he's talking about what does it mean to be a human person? And then if we lose that, then we get abolished. But what you said is we go to the beast. I think you quote this in the book, like, and you'll, you're an expert in, in the uh, Narnia Chronicles. But one point, doesn't uh, is it Lucy or someone says, like when you talk about in Narnia, what if it would be terrible if all human beings started to become beast-like? Mm. Maybe develop that. What's that part when she says that? Yeah, it's in Prince Caspian where um, they're attacked by a bear, um, right. which used to be a talking bear and has gone back to being just a, a bear who can't speak. And yeah, Lucy says, wouldn't it be terrible in our world too if, if men started going wild inside, but you couldn't tell who was wild and who was still human. So yeah, it's yeah, powerful. It's, it is powerful. And it's, um, I mean, it's a little bit like, you know, any number of apocalyptic or dystopian visions of the future of, you know, the body snatchers or, or, you know, um, zombies, people who still have ostensible human capacities and features, but are dead inside. So this is just Lewis's own take on that perennial problem. Yeah. But I think it's interesting because he's kind of early on in a lot of this dystopian literature. He's not alone, but he's, he's definitely in the early side. 1984 was 1946. When did you write that? 46, Orwell? Yeah, second half of the 40s, yes. Yeah. And then Huxley, when did he write Brave New World? 
I think that was a bit earlier, 1930-ish. Yeah, okay, yeah. So there's this kind of dystopian sense of like you're losing your humanity and, and Lewis is playing off this also in the World Wars. But so back to the head and the belly and the chest. I, yeah, I think this is such an important part because, you know, the way I would describe it as I was teaching undergraduates, I would say the head is like this little professor with a bow tie, you know, who's telling you what to do. So, And then the belly is this 500-pound gorilla. And the professor with the bow tie is like, you know, that's against the catechism. You're not allowed to do that. Well, that's not really going to tame the gorilla. And that you needed these ideas of nobility of virtue, of goodness, of heroism, in a sense, to tame and order the belly, the passions. And what strikes me, and I don't know how much of these other people you've read, but I think, you know, you see this as a project of a lot of 20th century Catholic philosophers. So Lewis, obviously, who wasn't Catholic, this idea of reasonable emotions. You see it in von Hildebrand, who talks about rehabilitating the heart. And what he says is intelligible spiritual affectivity. That's a German way of saying reasonable emotions. And then in Wojtyla, John Paul II, when he talks about spiritual emotions, and also I think then Ratzinger, Benedict the Sixteenth, in the rehabilitation of reason. In a sense, you go to Hume and Kant that, that the emotions and the passions are either idolized and focused on or, or like affirmed or this cold rationality. And Lewis is trying to say, no, you have to have both. And that seems like another theme. Do you want to develop that a little bit? And why that's so important to Lewis and how that manifests even in his other work? Yeah, it is. It's um, very important to Lewis. And indeed, it's very important to philosophy more generally. I, I, I have a quotation from Alistair McIntyre's great book, After Virtue. Indeed, one of the reasons I call my book After Humanity is a nod to After mm. Virtue. And I, I quote McIntyre pointing out what you've just alluded to. That I'll quote it here. Just as Hume, David Hume, seeks to found morality on the passions, because his arguments have excluded the possibility of founding it on reason. So Kant, Immanuel Kant, founds it on reason, because his arguments have excluded the possibility of founding it on the passions. And Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard, the, the gloomy Dane, founds morality on criterionless fundamental choice, because of what he takes to be the compelling nature of the considerations which exclude both reason and passions. So you see there, you've got Hume, Kant, and Kierkegaard all taking different approaches to the synthesis of the head and the belly. And none of them is, is satisfactory in Lewis's view, or indeed in, in my view. Or <laughs> and not that I'm any kind of philosopher, but right. um, Lewis seems to me to make a very integrated and holistic account of the human person. This is one of the reasons why I find it very persuasive that we have passions and we shouldn't be ashamed of our passions. The question is how to govern our passions and to rein them in in a way which doesn't either corrupt them or completely squelch them. And using the chest as a kind of airlock, as it were, between the head and the belly, so you're not just smushing up your reason against your passions, but you have this, this middle ground as a way of, you know, integrating them holistically. I, I think that's very persuasive to me. Yeah, no, it is to me too. I think it goes to our lived experience as persons. And, you know, your, your specialty is literary analysis and critique. This also seems to be a theme, this idea of the chest of integrated humanity seems to be, and of course the abolition man seems to show up throughout the space trilogy, the Narnian, all his, his other work. I mean, I think of Eustace Scrub is a bit of the person who's only the head without any passions and then becomes animalistic in the dragon. I mean, this seems to be something that he, he really is trying to get across to us in his own literary writings, but also in where he's pointing us to read, that the whole tradition takes this seriously. And somehow, now in modernity, we've rejected this tradition. That He keeps bringing us back to that tradition. Can you develop these themes of the chest in his fiction writing and also where he points us? Yeah, you're right. I'm much more of a literary critic than I am a philosopher. And so I do have a, a section in After Humanity where I talk about how these ideas from the abolition of man find their way into Narnia in particular, not least because there's an interesting point of connection between the two works in Lewis's use of the word MF, mm. which appears in the abolition of man in the notes, but is also the name of one of the characters in Narnia. MF is a Hebrew word meaning stability, fidelity, permanence, truth. So that provides a nice little link between the two works. But 
you can also find a, a link in the idea of the of the chest. Peter Pevensey grows up in the Narnia Chronicles to be a, a deep-chested man and shift the ape, the antichrist-like ape, discloses that apes always have weak chests. Um, so th- this is a little nod to the, that very model of the human person we were just talking about. And indeed, I think there's even a case to be made that Narnia as a whole, the country, the land of Narnia, is um, is a kind of chest as well, because to the north of Narnia, you have the sterile, rocky place where the northern witches come from, you know, the white witch who petrifies people and turns people to, covers the land in ice and snow. And to the south, you have Calaman, the hot land, the desert land, where this rather cruel and barbaric race of people live who like garlic and onions and um, very sensual. But Narnia is a temperate middle region, avoiding both of those two extremes. So it's a kind of um, subtle repurposing of the allegorical topography that Lewis uses in in the first book that he published after he became a Christian, The Pilgrim's Regress, which is an avowed allegory, which is built on this north and south imagery very explicitly. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep in the middle. The middle point is, uh, is, is good for Aristotle as it is for Alfred, as Lewis points out elsewhere. Go to the north or go to the south and, and you fall off the wagon. Go exclusively to the head or exclusively to the belly and you cease to be a human. Mm-hmm. And what about in um, that hideous strength and the Ransom series? That seems to be, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, you know Lewis much better than I, so I've, I'm <laughs> waiting here in dangerous ground making an assertion that I might get smacked down, but that's okay. That's called learning. So there's no safe space, right? We have to, we have to just get smacked down. But it seems to me like when he talks about, I think, is it the silver chair? You know, Eustace Scrub is this character who really is, in a sense, been robbed of his patrimony. And one thing that struck me as I read your book, which I wanted to ask you, at one point in your book, you're talking about this vicious subjectivism that that's one of the reasons you said he wrote this book is he felt himself had been a victim of vicious subjectivism and he had bought into it and it, it hurt him. Is used to scrub a young Lewis? Uh, well, yeah, in some respects, I think there is a bit of carryover between the young Lewis and uh, used to scrub. Not least, uh, other people have pointed this out from a different direction, actually, in that used to scrub in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader keeps a diary. And Lewis kept a diary in his 20s and then gave it up when he became, or around about the time he became a theist. And said he was going to give up this foolish and time-wasting practice of keeping a diary. And it's partly, I think, because he he began to find himself much less interesting than he had (laughs) when he began worshipping God and then the Christian God and and stopped worshipping himself. He thought his own, you know, maunderings in his diary every day were were less valuable than than he had considered them. Oh, interesting. But uh, to go to your earlier question about the Ransom Trilogy and the connection there to the abolition of man, yes. It's especially evident in the third book of the trilogy, That Hideous Strength, not least in this image of the head, the belly, and the chest, because the Mm -hmm. villains of that story worship a disembodied head, literally a decapitated head of a a French criminal, which they keep alive um, with various tubes and liquids and, and air pumped into the brain. But it's very definitely an attempt to go to that extreme of of overemphasizing the head, or as you said, spiritualism, or as it could also be called angelism. But of course, being an angel is, is nothing necessarily very good, because you know Satan is an angel, a fallen angel. And indeed, the villains of the peace in that hideous strength turn out to be effectively in the control of, of demons and devils. And the great triumph of the story is the vindication of the body, that we should celebrate our embodiedness, our em- and yes, our embeddedness, to use the word you you deployed earlier, very literally, Mark and Jane become embedded together. And they they make love. And for once, they make love without contraception. And as a result, they bring new life into the world um, that will be the new Pendragon, taking up the Arthurian elements of, of Lewis's novel. But that whole question of contraception and sexuality is something that Lewis touches upon too in The Abolition of Man, particularly in the mm-hmm. third chapter, And it's an aspect of Lewis's thought which has received remarkably little attention. But I think that it got into his mind, this question of the morality of contraception, because in 1930, around about the time he became a Christian, the Church of England, the church to which he belonged, relaxed their teaching on the ethics of contraception. And I think Lewis 
took that and ran with it, logically speaking, and began to ask himself, well, where will this lead us if we now regard it as acceptable to suppress an aspect of our humanity, that is to say, either our masculinity or our femininity, if we are prepared to sacrifice our fertility in our most intimate relationships, that is to say marriage, we're taking a new approach to the human person. We're taking a kind of mastery over ourselves rather than living into our true nature. And so I think that that whole question of contraception lies behind a lot of the abolition of man and therefore of that hideous strength. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, I, I noticed that especially um, contraception is a theme in that hideous strength. And the conditioners that he talks about in chapter three, one of my favorite lines from Lewis, which is probably my, my version of his line, is that man's power over nature is always some men's power over other men. And I think this is a profound insight into how we think about technology. So he connects that not just with like, you know, he said, people, propaganda and bombs are a tool where man has, you know, since controlled nature, but they're also propaganda and bombs are dropped on men as well. So at the end of the day, there's a few men using the power to control other men. And this, he says, comes to its fullness really in contraception and eugenics, where I think it's a brilliant line, and correct me if I get it wrong here, but it's like something to the effect of, you know, a lot of social writers don't do the same thing that physicists do. They forget time. And so they're thinking in this kind of, you know, snapshot view. But when you think about time, using contraceptives and then eugenic contraceptives, right? If you think about, I'm going to manipulate, I shouldn't say contraceptives, but I, you know, in vitro fertilization and other, other tools, you're in a sense having power over the next generation. So it looks like we have controlled nature, but in fact, from the future generation, you've been controlled. And I think this is very relevant for today, actually. And I don't know how much you follow this, but you know, there's the, the transhumanist movement and there's different kinds of transhumanism. Some is the idea that we're going to upload ourselves into the internet. Others are trying to you know, increase longevity. But also part of the transhumanist movement, I think, is just digital technology and also eugenics. There's a book that I mentioned to you. I've read parts of it. It's interesting. I don't say it's interesting that I, I think it's... Um, I don't know if it gives us a vision for the future that we want, but it's interesting to pay attention to what's happening. And uh, Jamie Metzl wrote a book called Hacking Darwin, Genetic Engineering and the Future of Humanity. And there's a rabbi, Asher Crisp, who gives some lectures on futurism and talks about like, what's actually going on in medicine and further with CRISPR technology and all these things that are going on. Lewis is identifying this problem early on that if we have a contraceptive idea, we have a eugenics idea, and thereby we're in a sense instrumentalizing people. And so it seems to me, tell me what you think about this, Michael, that, you know, the interesting thing about contraception is that in the act of contraception, that is, let's take the best possible act, okay? You have like a married couple who love each other and they have no intention to use one another, but by technologically manipulating the act, and extracting, as it were, pleasure and union from it. They, in a sense, whether they intend it or not, and this is kind of a Thomistic action theory, they instrumentalize the other. They turn the other into an instrument. And this, over time, has negative effects on how we treat one another, how we think about one another. And as this idea spreads into society, I think it leads to a real instrumentalization of others. And so, you know, if we look at Genesis, when God says to Eve, you will desire your husband and he will lord it over you. And we already have the problem of objectification deep in our psyche. It's already part of like the fallen world. You take this contraceptive idea and it further makes people instruments and objects of manipulators. And Lewis seems to be, that's my language, not his, but Lewis seems to be really identifying this and this focus on contraception is I think maybe surprising to many people. Do you think I'm, I'm getting this right and what Lewis is doing? Well, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think that's right. That contraception is a classic example of using a scientific development in a way which is subtly, very, very subtly anti-human, mm -hmm. dehumanizing, not only in the instrumentalization and objectification of the other person, but also with regards to oneself. One disintegrates oneself when one uses contraception. Because what one can say of oneself, I can chop off bits of myself, as it were. I can, I can separate out my fertility from 
every other part of myself, I can, in that sense, divorce one part of myself from the rest of myself and yet somehow not be disintegrated. Right. And that doesn't, that doesn't work, or at least not, not in the long term. Yeah. It sounds radical, you know, what, to say this, but in many ways, I think Lewis is saying this, and he's not alone, right? Other secular thinkers think that as well. But like the concept of practice really, I think, contributes to a lot of the confusion we have about what it means to be an embodied person today. I think there's confusion about gender. There's confusion about what sexuality is, marriage, babies. I mean, a lot of it is you kind of, I think, as you said, you disintegrate yourself. And then now the world becomes unclear. Your Mm. way of seeing the world is disordered. What do you think? That's right. That's right. Because you have, um, as it were, you've taken your own willpower and asserted that over against your own complete nature. And as a result, um, you are no longer going to be acting rationally. You quoted earlier the line about our power over nature turns out to be Mm-hmm. man's power over other men with nature as the instrument. Yes. Yeah. But those men themselves, those conditioners, are themselves at the mercy of irrational nature. Because right. by definition, they have separated themselves out of practical reason. And they are now at the mercy of their own appetites, their own random association of ideas, their own heredity, their own digestion, the weather, social forces, and indeed possibly diabolical forces, all of which play merry havoc with their sexual nature. So yeah, I think absolutely the current confusions we have about gender can be traced back, I think, very persuasively to the question of contraception back in 1930. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, if you haven't thought about that before, if listener, you might be hearing that and think, what? <laughs> But I think, you know, thinking about this, it's pretty clear. And there's a lot of writers doing this. And Paul VI was kind of clear about this as well. But yeah, I think that it sounds like a really shocking claim. But I I like the way you articulate the disintegration of yourself and others breaks everything apart. And then Mm -hmm. you think, well, I'm just, the way I describe sometimes, you're not just a body driving around in a car. Like, oh, sorry, my body hit you. You're an embodied, embedded person. And anything we do to disintegrate ourselves and disintegrate others disorders our view, our clarity of the world, which is something actually Lewis, you know, kind of quoting Aristotle saying, in order to understand the world, you have to be well brought up. You have to have certain underlying vision. Let me ask this question though, related to this. You make an important point, and I'm trying to find the exact quote, but you'll know it, I assume, which is where you talk about this idea about if man, this is uh, from Lewis, if man chooses to treat himself as raw material, then raw material he will be. Not raw material will be manipulated by himself, but by mere appetite, that's mere nature, in the person of the dehumanized conditioners. And so, in a sense, what happens is that the victory over nature is the victory of nature over us. And that's where he says it's the magician's bargain. We give up our soul and we get power in return. But ultimately, he says, what's left? And this is, I'm trying to find, like, all we have left is, I want. And so, maybe develop that out a little bit, because I think that's maybe a confusing part of this third chapter, right? You have to do some intellectual work. He's doing some intellectual aerobatics or, you know, here Mm -hmm. where he's kind of walking you down to see where it appears to be man kind of controlling everything. Ultimately, those final steps, and correct this if you think this is a bad analogy, like almost like instead of us, let me put it in, in say, Jewish and Christian language, instead of us having dominion over the earth, over the world, where we're both natural, we're created, but we have dominion over the world. This final victory, in a sense, fully embeds us as purely natural. And now we're only the result, as you said, of our digestion, of our neurology, our neurobiology, of natural selection, and we have no more freedom. And so in some senses, people like Sam Harris, who I think incoherently, but nevertheless, make the case to the same faults as Gaius and Titius do in the Green Book. But that we don't have any free will and we're simply just a product of nature. I mean, it follows, right? I mean, that's kind of Lewis's point. Could you walk us through that? Maybe, you know, feel free to correct anything I've said, but could you walk us through that part with Lewis? I think that is harder for people to follow. Yeah, it is the magician's bargain. And Lewis is there alluding to, uh, of course, the Faust myth, where Faust sells his soul to the devil and finds out that it's not a good bargain. <laughs> right. 
And it's, it's very interesting that, uh, again, here we have a nice little link between um, the abolition of man and Narnia. It's very interesting that one of Lewis's Narnia chronicles is called The Magician's Nephew. And the magician in that book turns out to be very much like one of these conditioners who's prepared to do to other people what he's not prepared to do to himself. And as a result, makes himself very stupid, can't understand basic things anymore. So yeah, it's it's the magician's bargain. It's, it's King Lear trying to both give up his kingdom and retain his kingdom. We're trying to control ourselves, forgetting that we ourselves are part of nature and that we have our own native constitution. We can't step outside it and stand over against it and still be one person. You know, it's like um, Robert Frost, you know, the, the road not taken. You can't take two roads and remain one traveler. You have to choose. In, in a nice little witty moment in The Abolition of Man, Lewis talks about um, the illogicality of this situation by reference to a, a famous Irishman who found that a certain kind of stove reduced his fuel bill by half and thence concluded that two stoves of the same kind would enable him to warm his house with no fuel at all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if we wish to treat ourselves as raw material, raw material we will be, as you just right. quoted. Uh, yeah. You can't have it both ways. Uh, either you have a an actual nature, which you need to get yourself in harmony with, or you don't. But if you don't, then what are you going to base your your judgments and your morals upon? And as we've already said, Lewis's conclusion is that you will base them on totally irrational things, which on the surface sounds like quite a good gain because you know, we can start doing what we want. But it turns out that what we want is not at all stable, that we want very different things. Um, not only do you and I want different things, but I myself want different things from moment to moment. Right. And I, I can't retain any kind of consistency about my own behavior if I base my moral ethics on sheerly what I want. Right. I need to do what I ought, not what I want. Yeah, I think two things stand out to me. One is, of course, Lewis deals with this question where he talks about instincts, right? He says, you know, sometimes we say, oh, it's just an instinct. And he said, well, that's just not going to work because, as you just said, we have competing instincts. So is there like another instinct that determines between the competing instincts? And then is that an instinct? I mean, he gets people to, I think, accept that, to look into the failed arguments there. But I, I think it's another thing that struck me as you were talking is important is, and we'll go into this maybe in the next section here. What does it mean to step outside the Tao, be in the Tao? What Tao? What is, I guess I should say Tao. What does that mean? But it seems like part of this confusion you see today as well is this sense that, you know, you're almost every thought you have. You're every feeling you have. And I, I tell people like, you're not your feelings. You're going to have lots of feelings all over the place. You're going to have lots of thoughts, lots of erratic things that just come in. I mean, John of the Cross, I think, is an expert on this, where you just have to think things just come in. You know, and if Thomas is right, that we get our knowledge from the senses and we're filled with things that we don't even realize we're seeing. You know, I mean, our, our visual neurons are picking up things, uh, like our eyes are picking up things, visual neurons, that in a sense are not part of our cognitive awareness. And these will come out later. There's a whole host of things. And I think right now, there's such confusion that almost like every feeling I have is what or who I am. I think that's a problem. And it also gets then, and I actually talk about this with Noelle Maring on a podcast I did on her book, Awake Not Woke, that it tends to be like every transgressive feeling I have is who I really am. And any kind of stable attachment to what I ought to do or any genuine morality is just performative. And the problem, of course, it's right in Lewis, is this empowers some men, that is men with power, over men, women, and children who don't have power. And so, as I've said before, you know, this idea that any restraint of your impulse or desire is somehow performative and not authentically you, that empowers predators and bad men and Jeffrey Epstein. It does not empower 15-year-old girls and women and children. And so, the other thing that I think, you know, maybe Lewis doesn't exactly address this, but it seems right in there in the conditioner, like by giving free reign to your desires. It just means that the most powerful abuse the weakest. And if you're outside the Tao, you're like Antigone with the king who can make a claim, as it were, that she has some responsibility to bury her brother. 
but it falls on deaf ears because we're outside the DAO. Do you think I've read that correctly and applied Lewis correctly? Yeah, I think I agree. The only slight qualification I'm, or you know, additional statement I would make is that the conditioners who wield this power over us are not actually wielding power, properly speaking. They're wielding something which is a corruption of power because power properly understood is not just the means by which I get my way. It's rather the means by which I live in harmony with myself and the world and other people. We tend to think of power as a, as a stick that we use to hit things with, but it's much better to think of power as a kind of electrical circuit or magnetic field mm -hmm. in which you have to have two poles working simultaneously um, and a field of force emerging between these, a field of power emerging between these two poles. And that's precisely what does not happen with, with a tyrant or an abuser or an autocrat, because he's just asserting himself, but he's not in any kind of loving relationship with those over whom he asserts that power. Yeah. So it's not truly power. Yeah. We tend now to use power as a dirty word, but power is not a dirty word. Power is an uh, you know, attribute of God, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. But that would lead us into a whole disquisition on the, on the nature of power. Well, maybe let's at least take a couple of minutes because I think you have a really good section on power, right? Where you make this four-part, five-part breakdown, I guess four-part breakdown of power, where you have different kinds of abuses of power, right? So based on what you said, power is not simply abuse, but you have an abuse of power for the tyrant, right? Who like unjustly uses power. And then you have other kinds of reaction to power. One is rebellion, right? Which can be good against tyranny. Right? So it can be a proper, but rebellion where you just, you know, you refuse to obey a legitimate authority. And then you have, what is it, servility, where you just kind of give in to power when you shouldn't. In that case, you need rebellion, right? And then the fourth one, remission, right? You're yeah, just, remissness. Remissness, remissness. Maybe I should have just asked you. You would have remembered faster than I did. Uh, <laughs> why, why don't you just go over those? I think it's super helpful because this confusion about power leads to a confusion about authority, a confusion about hierarchy. It goes right out of the, hierarchy of the head, the belly, and the chest, and their interrelationship. Uh, I think it confuses people about families, about the state. I think this four-part breakdown is helpful. Can you develop it a little bit for us? Yeah. It's not something that actually Lewis gets into very explicitly in The Abolition of Man. It's something that he talks about more in his book on Milton, A Preface to Paradise Lost, where he, he has a whole exposition of, of hierarchy, as it was understood Mm -hmm. in olden days. And yeah, there he talks about these four corruptions, which, which come in two pairs. So tyranny and servility play off each other, exacerbate each other. Rebellion and remissness likewise feed off each other and, and make each other worse. So we always tend to think about power only in terms of, or rather, we tend to think of the abuse of power only in terms of tyranny. But servility is just as bad. A tyrant is enabled to become a tyrant very often because those underneath him are servile. They don't stand mm -hmm. up to him. They don't properly assert themselves. And with regard to the other pair of abuses, remissness, that's when you fail to exert proper authority. You know, think of a school teacher who just lets his class run riot or the owner of a dog who doesn't train the dog properly. So the dog savages people and, and craps all over the carpet and things. Now, that's remissness, and remissness encourages rebellion, because why would you submit to an authority which was so paltry, which was so ineffective? There's nothing inherently wrong about submission to authority, as long as it's duly constituted and properly exercised. Mm -hmm. So I, I find this very, very helpful myself, this fourfold analysis of abuses of power, and too. a recognition that power properly understood is a good thing. Yeah, I do too. I mean, I think just like personally, you know, you think about it like I'm guilty of every one of those things, right? Not using my power in the appropriate way, you know, because I'm tired mm. <laughs> and I'm impatient with my children when it's just my fault, not theirs. Or remiss because I'm, you know, lazy or weak or cowardice to like say something to someone and, you know, tell them not to do something. You know, I think that's a, I think it's a challenge. And then, and then of course, 
you know, improper rebellion, et cetera. So I think it's helpful because it's a good way in a sense to examine your conscience. You know, we're talking about contraception. I'm going to tell you a story. So my wife and I went to a church a couple of years ago. It was after the HHS mandate in the United States where contraception was part of insurance and this big thing that took place, suits, et cetera. And so at the church, they had a little event to try to articulate what's the church's teaching on contraception. So I actually had to go debate someone, an economist who actually was kind of a Marxist later. And so I was one of the first speakers. And I decided, okay, Michael, I said, okay, I'm going to be very charitable because, you know, we're talking about contraception and you got to be careful. You got to, you know, you you don't want to like be judgmental and people don't understand, right? They just don't get it. It's just like, why is contraception wrong? I mean, we live in, you know, it's the 2000s. I mean, it's just such part of our life. And so I said, in order to do that, you can't just expect people to get it. It takes a long time. And I think first you have to go through anthropology and then what is a human being? What is an embodied person? What is sexuality? What is marriage? You know, what is the spousal act? And we, we go on and on. And so I was cheerful and it was, I was done. And then my wife was talking and my wife is very patient and um, she would have to be, as everyone says. So she was talking and there was a lady there who was probably in her 60s who kept interrupting her. And it was starting to get annoying. And finally I said, lady you got to stop talking and just be quiet. You need to read more and listen. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, I, Michael, I felt like I was like one inch tall. I was like, I can't believe I lost my temper with this lady. You know, it was just, I was too harsh, you know. So anyway, I had to leave and I left and I had to go to this debate mm-hmm. at this college, which helped me really in the debate because I was so patient and calm and chastised for my losing my temper. I think I won the debate hands down. I probably would have lost otherwise. Anyway, I came back and this, this event was still going on. All right. And this long story is to get to this point about remission. So we finished and all these people came up to me afterwards. And like my wife thought, oh, my poor love, you know, he's so disappointed in himself. And all these people came up to me and they said, thank you so much for telling that lady to be quiet. And <laughs> it was funny because I thought, wait, what? But I realized what they were feeling. There were women there in their 50s and all older who had really there was the remissiveness of priests and of teachers and of parents to tell them the truth about human sexuality and contraception. And then they had suffered from that. In a sense, they, the effects of it, like we talked about earlier, whether their intentions, this is not to judge anyone's moral character, okay? Life is hard. But the facts are, like the effects of it had affected them and they'd suffered, some of them with divorce. And they knew, like, I only had two children, I could have had more, my life isn't full. And so it was funny because when I said, be quiet, there was a rejoicing that I had told the truth. And so it was funny because I felt bad, you know, that I was too harsh. But they were grateful that I had not been remiss in my duty to exercise power. I mean, that's a long story, but it was a real lesson for me of we fail in our duty if we don't tell the truth in love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, quite. We tend to think of, as I say, of the terrible abuse of power can only be tyranny. And therefore, any exertion of power that somehow puts anybody else down in any way, however deserved, must be somehow tyrannical. But that's, that's just naive. You know, the shepherd is not just someone who goes around cuddling his flock. The shepherd also has a rod and staff by means of which he batters away the wolves. Right. And so, you know, that's, that's an aspect of leadership that we often overlook. But yeah. to, To explore this question of power even more fully, I think in the final section of my conclusion of After Humanity, I I have a whole section on power where I point out that from an early age, C.S. Lewis was very alive to the fact that might is not right. Mm -hmm. We've just been saying that power properly understood is a good thing, but part of the proper understanding of, of power is that it is not the only thing. Right. The, the power always stands in relation to the good, the true, and the beautiful. And so I think this is really, really, really important for today's cultural context, where, especially in the culture wars, where, where we mm-hmm. want to get a victory for our side, whatever yes. side that may be. Yep. But that's a very dangerous position to take because might is not right. Winning is not everything. There is such a thing as a pyrrhic victory. It's sometimes better to lose. It's sometimes better to die well than to live badly. Mm-hmm. And Lewis understood this as, as an absolutely essential aspect of, of humanity. And he finds it in the Aeneid, for instance, 
and in a lot of classical literature and in humane literature all over the world. I mean, this is why he, he calls this um, moral fund or moral reservoir the Tao. He deliberately chooses that Chinese term as a way of emphasizing the universality of, of morality and that mm-hmm. all human beings, by virtue of the fact that we are created in the image of God, have, have some kind of access to this recognition of the objectivity of value. And part of the recognition of that objectivity is that <laughs> it really is objective. And therefore, sometimes it will not suit us. But then we have to buckle down and, and pay the price. Mm-hmm. And that's why repeatedly in The Abolition of Man, Lewis keeps going back to this question of death for a good cause. Yeah. The Latin tag, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, it's sweet and seemly to die for one's country. That's the crucial test of the objectivity of value because it shows us that well, it brings home to us that it, that it can't, that value can't be merely subjective. If it were merely subjective, then when I be, had to begin to suffer and possibly even risk dying for what I believe to be good, I would change what I understood as the good, wouldn't I? If it was merely subjective, mm-hmm. I would make it more convenient for myself. I'd go easy on myself. But the fact that I follow through with with difficult but necessary tasks reveals to me, as much as it might show anybody else, that the thing I'm holding to is genuinely objective and that Mm -hmm. I will suffer in defense of that objectivity rather than change the rules just so I can get a victory. Right. I think you said a couple of important things. One is like very important in the culture wars not to simply just want to punish your enemies. It's the wrong thinking. Or to somehow give up fundamental standards of, say, rule of law in order to just win, you know. Mm. I think it's very, it's very dangerous. And I see that sometimes, you know. And I think we have to be always on guard of that. The other thing is, you know, you talk about this dying for a good cause. And the idea that you have to suffer for the right. And I think this is hard for us. I mean, you already dealt with some of it by saying it's, you need objective value in order to do that because you have to measure yourself to something that is unchangeable. Otherwise, if it's just your subjective experience, you're, you're going to always cave in. And I think this idea of like death before sin, dying well, it's preferable to die than to live badly. This is something that Lewis is really struggling against because, and correct me if I'm getting the context wrong, but you have like World War I, there's a sense like, you know, what did we do this for? And the real sense of like, what did we do this for? What were people dying for? Starts to combine with a debunking type of ethics and relativism so that a proper question of why are we dying for these people? Is this really the way I'm supposed to live? Like an existential question that's authentic gets muddied by really bad philosophy. Mm. And, and that seems to be what Lewis is worried about. I mean, do I have that right? And then maybe develop that out because I think he, in a sense, too, right, was a skeptical of what happened in World War I, but he wasn't ready to give up the Tao, give up objective value just because something went wrong. What do you think? That's right. Yeah. One of his favorite Latin tags is abusus non tollet usum. Abuse does not abolish use. Sure, the Tao can be twisted and perverted and traditional values can be distorted so as to achieve a certain end. But just because they can be abused doesn't mean they don't have any continuing validity. So yeah, very properly questions should be asked about you know, for instance, Britain's war aims during the First World War. That's a political question. But the philosophical question about whether there can be such a thing as as a just war or, you know, defense of the right, that doesn't suddenly become a live question just because of a bad war. Right. I point out in the course of my book that a lot of Lewis's thinking on this question may well have arisen through because of his own experience in the Great War. He was a teenage officer in the British Army during the First World War and very nearly died in the trenches of France in the spring of 1918. And I have a photograph of, of Lewis in uniform, the only photo that we have of him as a young officer cadet. And next to him in this photograph is, is his friend Paddy Moore, who did mm-hmm. indeed die. And as a result of Paddy's death, Lewis's whole life was changed. Right. Because he, he had made a promise to Paddy that if Paddy were to be killed, he, Lewis, would look after Paddy's mother and sister. And so for the rest of 
Mrs. Moore's life, Paddy's mother's life, Lewis lived with her. And for about 20 years, he lived with Paddy's sister until she married and moved away. So I point out how this autobiographical episode has, has been largely overlooked in treatments of the abolition of man. But when you think about it, when, when you think about Lewis coming downstairs every morning and sitting at the breakfast table, and there's an empty chair at the breakfast table, which ought to have been occupied by this Paddy friend of his, it's a live issue. It's a, it's a really testing existential question of, did we suffer and die in the, in the First World War in vain? Was there any good about it at all? And a lot of people, most famously Wilfred Owen, the war poet, suggested that, no, dolce et decorum est was just an old lie. And so forget all that. You know, goodbye to all that, as Robert Graves had it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that emotional response is very, very, very understandable. Mm -hmm. Lewis shares in it himself in his own book of poems, Spirits in Bondage. But adopted as a fixed philosophical view about morality, it's disastrous and can only lead to more wars. Right. And it's almost like... It presses you to say, shall we just give up on everything? But it's only because there's the Tao behind it that you're even able to ask the question, right? Mm. That's what Lewis is also, I think, getting us to think constantly, right? That, wait, even your ability to ask this question, you know, there's, this happens, people will say, you know, all I believe is empirical things and like everything else is not true. Okay, well, first of all, we know that's not coherent on its own terms because you can't verify it. But underlying that is like, reason is good. Mm. knowledge is good. And this is, I think, where he, it's tricky because you have to, he makes you work. But you have to think like, well, this whole, you know, dying is great for your country. I mean, it's just bunk. Okay. Was, is there something that's not bunk? Mm. What's the standard for thinking about that? And I think that's what Lewis is getting back to. I want you to comment on that, but I do want to point out in your book, you have this photo gallery, which is great. So yeah, so listeners, you have to get this book, okay? And for a lot of reasons. One, if you have not read The Abolition of Man, read The Abolition of Man. I mean, The Abolition of Man is great. And I tell people all the time, just get it and just read the first chapter. Just You can get the first chapter done, Men Without Chests, right? And if you only read that, it's a wonderful beginning. And if you can get through the whole thing, which would be in the past hard, but not hard anymore because of Michael Ward's great book, After Humanity. But also there's a photo gallery with pictures of Lewis, pictures of some of the people that he refers to and quotes people like you know, Horace and Cicero and, and Confucius. But also you see the teachers who wrote the green book that he talks about. And uh, it's a really great section there. So I recommend another thing I recommend about that. I know we have to go pretty soon, Michael. So let me ask a couple questions about the idea of the Tao. And he uses the term Tao on purpose to get outside of the Western Christian tradition. He does admit in the book that he is a theist and a Christian. I already knew that already, I think. But here's a question of, um, of natural law. There's this part where in a sense, we just talked about it. In a sense, it's unavoidable. You just can't step out of the Tao. Any critique of the Tao is in a sense, assuming it. So like I gave the example, well, I don't believe in all this like, right and wrong and stuff. I just believe in mathematics. Okay, why is math better than not math? And what is better? And what is good? And like, again, why is reason better than non-reason? I mean, so either you can be a skeptic and just silence, or you're like a radical nihilist, but then like, keep it to yourself. Okay. So in a sense, there's that part of the Tao that's natural and unavoidable. But there's another sense where people would argue, look, you want to know what natural is? Go down to the psychiatric wards, go down to the prisons, go down to family court, look at the abuse, look at, you know, the horrors of war. That's natural. That's what men do. And this kind of uplifted view of human nature and reason, it's only because we're comfortable and we have books around us and we're not raised in very harsh situations that we have the luxury to think about this. And so that's part one. How do you think Lewis and you would address that? And then the second question will be on, does the natural law require ultimately revelation? Like, can you know it without revelation? So why don't we take the first one first? Isn't the natural law simply a product of our long embedded Western Christian, Jewish, Roman, Greek civilization? And that it's just false to think this is somehow nature. How do you respond to that? Well, one of the ways that Lewis responds to it in The Abolition of Man is by pointing out that 
in the appendix to the abolition of man that all human cultures and civilizations that that you care to examine seem to recognize that certain things are good and certain things are evil and that it's impossible to imagine a society in which men were honored for throwing down their weapons in battle and running away and betraying their own side to the enemy. That's just an impossible, that's inconceivable, to quote the Princess Bride. It's inconceivable. (laughs) But as to the the question of of what is truly natural, well, that's a very big question. And, And to be honest, Lewis doesn't get into that in any very significant way in The Abolition of Man. For that, readers should refer to Lewis's book, Studies in Words, where he has a very interesting chapter on the various meanings of of nature. So I won't get into that if you don't mind. No, not at all, yeah. As regards the question of natural theology, yeah, I I think this is one of the reasons why the abolition of man has has acquired such a wide readership from people of, of many different religious traditions and none. There's a very prominent atheist philosopher in Britain at the moment right now called John Gray. Yeah. And he is a great admirer of the abolition of man. He he devoted a whole radio, BBC radio broadcast to analysing the abolition of man not so long ago and regards it as very prescient and prophetic, as relevant now as when it first came out, if not more so, he says. And he's an atheist, but he's an atheist who, who understands the, the need to recognise objective value. And so from a Christian point of view, as indicated earlier, we can point to... God's creative act and the fact that all human beings are made in the image of God as a ground for this ability to recognize objective value, that by virtue of our creation in the image of a good, true, and beautiful God, we have some kind of link to or root in the good, the true, and the beautiful by means of our conscience, particularly when it comes to to ethical matters. And St. Paul, you know, most famously in the letter to the Romans, makes this point very clearly, doesn't he? That the Gentiles who are without the law are a law unto themselves when their conscience now condemns them, now acquits them. This is part indeed of what it means to be human. Right. And that the Gentiles are a law unto themselves is really what Lewis, I think, is also trying to articulate in the appendix, right? Where he says, everybody kind of knows this. And And I think sometimes when I talk about this, one of the ways I'll say, instead of saying man's nature, Human persons are a certain kind of being, a kind of thing. There's some kind of essential structure to human beings. And part of that is rationality. And again, back to the tripartite division, we don't have to get into the... I would like to sometime talk about the tripart, how that affects like spirit, soul, and body. But the, the idea of the head, the belly, and the chest, that we're a certain kind of being. And I think like Thomas would say something to the effect of that the natural law is the human person's participation in the eternal law. And for Bonaventure, because we're image, part of that image is that we, we have access to the eternal law or to the, some sense of, of conscience and right and wrong. So I think, so I think it's, it's an interesting question. Probably in practice, it definitely helps to have revelation, right? For sure. The question is, are you the kind of thing or being that somehow senses the difference between right and wrong, I would say that's what Aquinas, right, means with his practical intellect, right? That we apprehend before any other type of syllogistic discursive thought, right? We apprehend good is to be done in pursuit and evil is to be avoided. Now, whether we get that right or not, that's a whole other question, but we apprehend that just by that's who we are. Would you say that that's a self-evident position? Yeah. Absolutely. So the abolition of man, as as we've sort of been suggesting all the way along, is, is a purely philosophical work. And Lewis doesn't get into questions of specific revelation. He's he's working purely on grounds of general revelation through the use of logic and reason and observation and anthropological philosophy. But yes, as you just said, it's much easier to make the case if you have some theistic or Christian religion above it, or or perhaps you would say beneath it. Um, and Lewis frankly acknowledges that elsewhere. He says that morality apart from religion can't explain its own claims clearly. Try any philosophical system of ethics, he says. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't stop him from going as far as he can under purely philosophical right. steam in The Abolition of Man. And um, the fact that it, it has caught the interest of people like John Gray and many other thinkers who are not sharers in Lewis's 
Christianity is a, is a testimony, I think, to the value of, of Lewis's book. Yeah, I think it's just a great book. So two quick things. Uh, one stands out, I think it's just maybe you can touch on, you know, he begins the whole book with asking about a waterfall. And as those, those two travelers are going along and they see a waterfall and one says it's pretty and the other says it's sublime. And um, the poet Coleridge affirms the sublime and disagrees with beauty. And then this, how he talks about it in the book, well, they're not really talking about the waterfall, they're just talking about their feelings. And so first Lewis walks through and says, that's just not coherent, even linguistically, but really gets then to this is the key element. And I remember when I taught undergraduates, I thought, I would spend about six weeks on does truth exist? Can we know it? Does law of non-contradiction hold? And I spend a lot of time actually on beauty because I think pure subjectivism in beauty is a door to relativism and morality. But it's also a doorway back in. And I think something that I like about Lewis that shaped me is that like your subjective experience matters. And you are having a subjective experience of objective reality. And that is, I think, one of the other great advantages of this book, that he's not denying the subjective. He's saying, in order for the subjective to matter, there has to be objective. And so he's, in a sense, what I say, rehabilitating, reaffirming the subject against a nihilistic, dehumanizing worldview. What do you think? Absolutely. There's only any point in telling you about my subjective perspective on, on a waterfall, say, if there is a real waterfall that you and I are both looking at. Now, admittedly, we might take different views of that waterfall, and we could have a, a good old argument about whether we should call it sublime or pretty. But there's only any point in having that debate if we're talking about something that really exists outside our own perceptions. So we need objectivity in order to defend subjectivity. And indeed, once you have objectivity, the subject becomes all the more glorious. And right. you know, in Lewis's Christian writings, he can say that you know one of the reasons we have been made as individuals is that so that each person can praise that unique aspect of the divine nature, which only he can see. You know, we have unique, peculiar value as individuals, but only because there is an objective thing to which we are all connected. Right. You know, in a in an atheistical point of view, that's the world. And in a theistic point of view, that's God. And in a Christian point of view, that's the Christian God. But in, in a purely subjectivist world, there's no point in talking about anything. Right. Well, everything becomes transactional, right? Yeah, I'm only concerned what you think because I need to transact something from you. Mm. It's really dehumanizing. You know, you, and you think, I, I just think of that weight of glory line where he says, you've never met a mere mortal, right? Nature's cultures of it, these are mortal, but it is immortals whom we work with, joke with, marry, stub, and exploit. That sense of the, the dignity of the person. And he says later, like, all our politics and all our play, everything is really root grounded in this person. And so, in a sense, the abolition of man is a defense of the person, I think. And, mm. and so, that's what's so striking, why I think it's so important, because we live in a time where the person is pushed down and he affirms the person. And the other thing, and we can finish this, is I go now to your book, Planet Narnia. And so thanks for coming. I hope we can come back and we can talk about Planet Narnia, which is pretty epic. I mean, so Michael Ward is making a case here in Planet Narnia that only he knows what C.S. Lewis was really doing. <laughs> I'm giving you a hard time a little bit, but he makes a pretty awesome case for kind of a hidden gem to understand the Chronicles of Narnia. One of see now now I see how I did that was rhetorically forcing him to come back to debate this with me. Uh, so, um, but one of the things you talk about in the Planet Narnia is you talk about this idea of joviality, and ransom in the trilogy is a kind of an example of joviality. And it, I thought this, and so do you think this is right? This is a, just a pure question for me. Part of joviality has to do with the planets that you talk about, but there's a sense of the difference between pleasure and joy. And that pleasure we can get, but joy can't be grasped. It has to, in a sense, be the, the like in von Hildebrand's language, like the fruit of love relationship. And that the abolition of man, in a sense, eradicates joviality. It eradicates feasting. It kind of brings everything flat. And so that what he's doing in the abolition of man, as I said, affirming the person, he's also trying to, like in a sense, reaffirm the embodied, embedded person who's meant to feast and have joviality in the midst of suffering and pain. And that can have meaning. And it's all about, in a sense, the meaning of the person. That's why I think, like, I'm enthusiastic about this book. I think this book is epic because it's like 
being is good. Joy is the fruit of love relationships. And if you want the subjective person, the, the curse of positivism and materialism and nihilism, you know, it sounds intellectually in, sophisticated, but it's a curse that removes jo- joviality. And so it seems to me, as I read your work, this is your insight. That for the, I mean, I got this from you reading you, that it's an affirmation of joviality and feasting. Am I off topic? What do you think about that? Well, the abolition of man is, is an affirmation of, of all values, whether they are jovial, martial, mercurial, lunatic, venereal, saturnine, or, or the one I think I'm overlooking. <laughs> cool. um, solar, yes. Oh. So um, the question is not why we should prefer joviality over being saturnine, but why we should have any belief in saturnine qualities or jovial qualities at all. Mm-hmm. That's a point that Aaron Smildy, if that's the correct pronuncia- pronunciation of his name, the Dutch Lewis scholar makes, and I quote him several times in After Humanity, because Smilder has a, has a very strong take on the purely negative aspect of Lewis's argument in The Abolition of Man, that he, he's just saying, in effect, why do you believe in anything? And you've touched on this a, a, few, a few times in what you've been saying, um, that Subjectivism, though it looks convenient for a bit, turns out to be disastrous. We want to be subjective about (laughs) the things that don't matter to us, but we are terribly objective about things which do matter to us. Mm -hmm. And and Lewis is just pointing out the self-serving dodge that subjectivism amounts to. Right. Okay. Well, Michael, thanks for your time. We've gone over an hour here and um, we'll come back and talk about Planet Arnia, but any kind of final concluding thoughts for people? about the abolition man and your kind of, maybe your intellectual sales pitch for Lewis's abolition (laughs) man. Well, the the, the quick sales pitch is that if you admire C.S. Lewis, but don't know the abolition of man, you really need to get to know it because uh, he regarded it as almost his favorite among his books. And other scholars, quite apart from me, have described it as as the all but indispensable introduction to the entire corpus of Lewisiana. It's been described as the linchpin of all his works. I go so far in this book as to describe it as possibly the theme of his work, philosophically considered, Mm -hmm. and all the other works, merely variations upon that theme. If you have enjoyed, for instance, the first few chapters of of Mere Christianity, but want a slightly more sophisticated run-through of of that argument, then Abolition of Man is precisely where you should look, because Mm -hmm. those two works are, are very closely related, Mere Christianity being a popular version Abolition being the academic equivalent. So those are two, um, you know, pitches, as it were, for the importance of abolition, and therefore, I hope, for the relevance of my guide. On a purely practical note, I would say that if you want to get After Humanity, do get it through the publisher's website, Word on Fire Academic, and that way you will get a free copy of The Abolition of Man with a matching cover. Harper Collins, the publishers of The Abolition of Man, have kindly brought out a new edition which matches the front cover of of my book. So you get two books for the price of one if you go through the publisher, but don't buy it through Amazon or other booksellers. Okay, good. I'll put a link to that in the show notes for this, Word on Fire. And then you get get a free copy of The Abolition of Man. So it's it's great. Excellent. Good. Well, thank you, Michael, for your time. Thanks for um, taking time out of your day to talk about this. And thanks for your work on this book. It's such a great... I mean... I wish I had this when I was teaching. It would have made my life a lot easier. Mm. And I learned so much from it. And also from your other books, which is re-inspired to go back into reading C.S. Lewis and his real profound insights of what it means to be a human being and what a gift his work is and a gift your work is for highlighting it. So thanks for coming on the Moral Imagination Podcast. My pleasure. Thanks. And I look forward to coming back to speak about Planet Narnia one of these days. Great. Sounds good.